Hello everyone, what is up? Welcome back to another episode of Killer Instinct. If you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I'm your host of Killer Instinct. Before we get started, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button, that way you never miss an episode. We post weekly on the podcast every Wednesday, as well as the YouTube video version on Wednesdays as well, and you are not going to want to miss it. Now, as you guys can tell by the title of today's episode, today we are talking about the disappearance of Kathy Moulton. Kathy went missing in September of 1921, and to this day, it is the oldest unsolved case in the state of Maine. In just a few weeks from you hearing this, we will be hitting the 52-year mark on Kathy's disappearance, so I figured that this would be a great case to cover today to bring back the awareness on Kathy's case because as you will see as we go through it, Kathy's case got very limited coverage from the very beginning. This is a very frustrating case because it is one of those cases where while it is unsolved, while this is considered a cold case, while we don't really know what happened to Kathy, we do have a little bit of an understanding as to what could have happened to Kathy and who could have been involved in Kathy's disappearance. So I'm really interested to hear what you guys have to say about it. And with that being said, let's jump right on into it today. Kathy Moulton was last seen wearing a navy blue colored weather coat, a navy blue pants dress, and brown leather shoes. Kathy Moulton was born on June 28th, 1955, to her parents, Claire and Lyman Moulton. She was the oldest of three, having two younger sisters, and the family lived in the popular town of Portland, Maine. Lyman was the owner of Ray Moulton's used car service, and while Claire used to work as an emergency room nurse, she gave up that career to be a stay-at-home mom when Kathy was born. Kathy was described as a kind and reserved girl. She was definitely more introverted, and she had a few very close friends. However, she was liked by everyone. Kathy was said to be very easily trusting of others, and her mom mom said that Kathy had the mindset that if you were nice to other people, that they were going to be kind to you in return. Very much the treat others how you would like to be treated mindset. Some of Kathy's hobbies included poetry, music, dancing, fashion, and clothing. She was incredibly creative, and she also worked as a babysitter in her spare time and was also known to help out some of the elderly in her neighborhood, whether they were sick or whenever they needed assistance. Kathy was always the first to volunteer and go check on them or see if she could bring them anything. That was the type of girl that she was. At the time of her disappearance, Kathy was a junior at Deer High School, which is located just right down the street from where she lived. And as Kathy got older and started entering her high school teenage years, she definitely started to crave that sense of independence that a lot of teenagers also feel. Kathy wanted to be taken a little bit more seriously. She felt like if she acted older and more mature, that she would be seen as more cool. And that is when the rebellion side of her definitely kicked in. And it wasn't anything that was out of the ordinary or anything that was so extreme or that was unusual for any other teenager who had also gone through this phase. It wasn't anything radical. It was just one of those phases of life. She started keeping some secrets from her parents. Like I said, she started smoking. Her parents didn't know about that. But more than that, Kathy had a boyfriend that her parents did not know about. Kathy, who was 16 years old at the time, had a 20 two-year-old boyfriend named Lester Everett. Now, I think that most people can agree that no parent of a 16-year-old daughter would want them to be dating a 22-year-old, and Lester was no exception, and Kathy knew that, which is why she kept it from her parents. Lester was definitely known to be a troublemaker. He rarely got in trouble when it came to the law, but it was just the average bad boy 
type of vibe. It was believed that Lester and Kathy met at one of Kathy's favorite coffee shops called The Gate. From the second that Lester and Kathy met, Kathy was head over heels for Lester. She had this older guy who had this bad boy vibe about him, and she saw hard eyes from the second she saw Lester. It's unclear what Lester's view of this relationship, for lack of a better word, was, whether he was taking it seriously or not. Again, she was 16 years old, he's 22. Something is wrong from the very beginning there. However, when it came, however, when it came to Kathy's point of view, Kathy was smitten with Lester. Now, in the summer of 1971, the year that Kathy went missing just several months before, Kathy's father Lyman took off work and led the whole family on an 81-day cross-country trip throughout the U.S. and Mexico. And this was the first time that Kathy had ever really gotten to travel and travel outside of the country as well. The trip had crossed over with Kathy's birthday, so all the family was together, they were celebrating, and Kathy had an amazing time on this vacation. Her parents had actually purchased her a small leather tote that she was so excited about. She wore it everywhere, and Kathy was just very, very happy, and this was a great time for the family. However, unfortunately, this would be the last trip that they would ever take as a family of five. Dr. Robert Haddon was the kind of OBGYN you would recommend to your best friend. Calm, knowledgeable, and greeted everyone with a smile. But his cheerful demeanor hid an ugly truth. Dr. Robert Haddon was found to be a serial predator who abused hundreds and potentially thousands of patients over his decades-long career. Once these stories began to see the light of day, one question remained. How was this physician, who was trusted with the lives of so many, able to get away with this for so long? When the powerful institution that he worked for was confronted with these accusations, did it choose to protect its own reputation? Exposed Cover Up at Columbia University, the new podcast from Wondery and Dr. Death's Laura Beale is a story about people who are supposed to protect us, physicians, prosecutors, and the people around them. And it asks, did these institutions provide cover for a known predator? Listen to Exposed Cover Up at Columbia University on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen to Exposed ad-free on Wondery Plus. Get started with your free trial at wondery.com slash plus. So this brings us to September 24th of 1971, and September 24th, 1971 was a Friday, and it started out like any normal day. Kathy woke up, she went to school, she came home, and when she got home, she asked her dad, Lyman, if he could take her into town so she could go shopping. Later that night, on September 24th, Kathy had plans to go to the local YMCA dance with some of her friends, and she was so excited about it. She wanted to go shopping to grab a couple little last things that she needed for her outfit and asked her dad if he could give her a ride and drop her off into town. Before leaving, Kathy went up to her mom and asked for some money that she could take into town. Kathy's mom, Claire, gave her the money as well as asked Kathy that when she was out shopping to stop and grab two tubes of toothpaste. So she gives her the money, asks for the toothpaste, and Kathy and Lyman are on their way for Lyman to drop Kathy off. Kathy ended up getting dropped off at approximately 1.15 p.m. in front of the New England Telephone and Telegraph office located in between Cumberland Avenue and Forest Avenue. Carly spent the next few hours grabbing what she needed for the dance, which included thread, pantyhose, as well as those tubes of toothpaste that her mom asked for. At approximately 5.30 p.m., Kathy met up with one of her friends named Carol Starbird. Carol was working at a music store called Starbird Music, and the two of them talked for some time before Kathy told Carol that she needed to go home, needed to shower, and get ready. Kathy also told Carol that it was going to take her longer than usual to get home because Kathy had spent the money that was supposed to be used on her bus pass 
pass on her shopping trip. So now Kathy had no money for a bus pass, which meant that she would have to walk the two miles to get back home. Kathy said goodbye to Carol and the two planned on seeing each other that night at the dance. They said their goodbyes and Kathy was on her way. However, she never made it home. The Moulton's night went on as normal as it could until it didn't. Lyman was watching the evening news and Claire was busy preparing dinner and as time passed and Kathy wasn't coming home like planned, Claire began to get incredibly worried. The Moulton's had a family rule where if any of the three girls were not making it home that night for dinner, that they always had to call and let their parents know of the change of plans. This was something that all three of the girls always did and were very responsible about. However, this time, Kathy never called. So approximately around 6.30 p.m., Claire called the police. She wasted no time. She called the police and tried to file a missing persons report. However, according to Claire, she said that when she called to file, the police pretty much laughed at her. They told Claire that she had to wait at least 72 hours to file a missing persons report, and they went on this whole speech about how teenagers miss curfew all the time, and I'm sure she'll show up. She probably just lost track of time, blah, blah, blah. But Claire and Lyman knew their daughter. They knew Kathy, and they knew that she wouldn't forget to call. Claire began calling all of Kathy's friends to see if anyone knew where she was, however, no one did. At this point, Lyman drove downtown to the same spot where he dropped Kathy off several hours prior and started driving around seeing if he could spot Kathy. However, again, there was no luck. It was straight from downtown where Lyman drove over to the Portland police station himself, and for a lack of a better term, he pretty much raised hell and told them that they needed to find a report and start an investigation to look for Kathy. He explained that Kathy was an extremely responsible girl who would never just not call home. She also didn't have any money. She didn't even have enough money to pay for a bus ticket home. So the idea that she would just run away from home was ridiculous, especially because she was so excited about this dance that she had later that night. Even when she saw Carol at the music store, Carol even said that all Kathy could talk about was this dance. She was so excited and she was planning on attending that night. So Claire and Lyman knew that their daughter would just not voluntarily up and decide to miss this dance. But still, the officers dismissed the concerns of Claire and Lyman and told them to go home. And not only that, they told them not to come back for a few weeks weeks, not just days, weeks. They said that if you don't see or hear from her for a few weeks, then come back and we'll file the report. So Lyman went home that night. Him and Claire waited up all night to see if Kathy would come home and she didn't. And this is when Lyman and Claire, they weren't taking no for an answer anymore. And good for them, quite honestly. Because that next morning, Lyman got back in his car, drove over to the police station, and at this point, it was pretty evident to the officers that Lyman was not going to take no for an answer. So they agreed to file the report. However, they still refused to investigate or just search for Kathy the at all. Along with that, as I mentioned in the very beginning, Kathy's case got no attention from the media. There was maybe one newspaper article about her disappearance in the very beginning, but that was it. So because of that, no one even knew to look for Kathy. And you will see as we continue on in this case, there were multiple witnesses who claimed to have seen Kathy. However, no one knew to look for her. No one knew that she was missing. Now, the Moultons realized very quickly that they needed to take matters into their own hands because the police were certainly not going to do that for them. So they ended up hiring a private investigator and they also contacted Portland's FBI office and spoke with the director. However, the director said that they were unable to launch an official investigation due to the lack of evidence of an abduction. So even though it seemed as if Carly just vanished off the face of the earth, 
they still felt like there wasn't enough evidence for an abduction. Now, at this point, the Moltons were really just relying on their private investigator as well as themselves. They started passing out missing persons flyers and talked to anyone who claimed to have seen Kathy that day. So what we know now that we didn't know then was that on the afternoon of September 24th, 1971, when Kathy was walking home, her 22-year-old boyfriend named Lester pulled up in a 1963 blue Cadillac. Granted, this car was stolen and police figured that fact out later. However, Lester pulls up in his car. Kathy's walking home. Lester pulls up and he told Kathy that he was going to take a quick trip somewhere. He needed to drop a friend off, but would be more than happy to drop Kathy off at her house along the way. He told her that there was no point in her walking the two miles and really convinced her to get in the car, which she did. Now, when Kathy got into the car, she realized that Lester was not alone. When she got into the car, Lester introduced her to a friend of his that was sitting in the passenger seat. Lester introduced this friend to Kathy as Reed. Reed was in his early 20s and had long pigtails. So now the three of them are in the car and they're driving. And what Kathy didn't know at the time was that this quote-unquote quick stop that Lester told her that he needed to make before dropping Kathy off was actually a four and a half hour drive to New Brunswick, Canada to drop Reed off at his house. And truthfully, no one really knows what happened to Kathy after that. Now, due to the lack of media coverage, like I said, there were multiple people who claimed to have seen Kathy in the days following her disappearance. It was actually said that Kathy, Lester, and Reed spent four days together up until the 28th of September when Lester returned back into the United States by himself. But again, no one knew that Kathy was missing. No one knew to look for her. So no one knew to call the police. Now, one of these witness statements included a woman who claimed to have seen Kathy at a shopping mall the day she was last seen in Portland. The mall was located in Bangor, Maine, which is approximately two hours away from Portland. However, the woman didn't know that Kathy was missing at the time because this was just one one day after her disappearance. She did say that Kathy didn't seem like she was in any distress, but she wouldn't know for sure because she never spoke to her. Another witness claimed that they saw Kathy four hours away on Presque Island. The woman said that she saw Kathy at a gas station with two men, and one of the men escorted her to the bathroom and stood guard at the door before walking her back to the car. Now, when Lyman and Claire heard about this, they drove out to Presque Island themselves and spoke with officers. However, the local officers had to break the news to Claire and Lyman that they never knew that Kathy was missing because the police had actually never officially filed the report. As you can imagine, this was devastating to hear for Lyman and Claire. So again, they continued doing their best to just hang up flyers in the area and pass out missing persons posters. And just as a little side note to that, what we do know now is that the girl that was seen in Presque Island did actually end up being found and she was a missing girl from Connecticut. So it was not Kathy. Now, unfortunately, as far as leads and witness statements go, that really was all there was to it. That's all that Claire and Lyman had to go off of and of course there was very little interest from the Portland Police Department still after months and years went on of this case because police truly did believe that Kathy left on her own accord they labeled her as a runaway pretty much right from the start 
And that's what made this case turn cold for quite some time. However, for years after Kathy's disappearance, her parents still left their door unlocked at night. They left their porch light on and they were always waiting by the phone, hoping for Kathy's return. Now, in 1995, this case actually ended up getting reopened and it was reopened by a detective named Detective Caddy. When Detective Caddy looked at this case, he was actually shocked by how little was done in the investigation. When he was first handed over the case file, he opened it and he thought that he was missing another file. He thought that there was something else that he was missing. However, that just goes to show how little was done in this investigation. So he realized very quickly that he was going to have to be starting from scratch when it came to Kathy's disappearance. Now to start, he decided the best thing to do was to talk to the people that knew Kathy the best, and that included her friends, her parents, and that is when he learned about Lester, her boyfriend. Detective Caddy theorized that Kathy had gotten into Lester's car and accepted his ride home because she did not have enough money for the bus pass. Now, because none of the witnesses who claimed to have seen Kathy actually spoke to her, it was impossible to know whether or not she was being held against her will or not. It was impossible to know whether she was a 16-year-old who was with her 22-year-old boyfriend and decided to rebel and just followed his lead, or if she was actually in grave danger. No one was able to tell that. Now, what Detective Caddy was able to do was look into Lester Everett's background, and that is how he was able to figure out that Lester Everett was the prime suspect in the theft and stealing of a 1963 four-door blue Cadillac, which is the same car he was seen driving around with Kathy and Reed in. Now, the owner of this Cadillac was a woman named Mrs. Davis. It wasn't clear what her first name was, but we do know that it was Mrs. Davis, and she ran a motel called Davis Motel, and that is where the car was stolen from, and it was actually the same place where Lester used to work. So Lester used to work at the Davis Motel and stole the car from Mrs. Davis. Now, Mrs. Davis actually contacted Detective Cat after she received her credit card statement and saw that there was a transaction from a place called Dorsey's Garage. Now, Mrs. Davis ended up reaching out to Detective Caddy because when she received her credit card statement, she saw that there was a transaction from a place called Dorsey's Garage located in Aerostook, Maine. And the transaction that was on her credit card was from four car tires. So at that point, Detective Caddy went to Dorsey's garage. Now, the transaction was in the 1970s. So it was very much in the beginning of Kathy's disappearance. However, when this case got reopened and Detective Caddy looked into Lester Everett, found out that he stole the car and reached out to Mrs. Davis, that is when he learned about the transaction from Dorsey's garage. So he decides to follow up with this lead and he headed out to Dorsey's garage where he met with a guy named Don Logan. At the time, Don Logan was working as a mechanic at Dorsey's garage, and Don told Detective Caddy that in December of 1971, he did remember seeing Lester, Reed, and Kathy together. He claimed that Lester came in to see him because he needed new tires on the Cadillac. Now, while Don Logan claimed that he didn't see anything that caught him too off guard, he did remember thinking that Reed and Lester were definitely controlling over Kathy. He remembered that the entire time that the three of them were waiting for the tires, Reed kept his hand on the back of Kathy's neck throughout the entire duration of the appointment. He also claimed that when Kathy said that she needed to go to the bathroom, that Reed escorted her to and from the bathroom while still maintaining his hand on her neck. Now, Don said that the only reason that he even remembered the three of them to begin with was because a week after Lester was in the shop, a different detective had approached him about the stolen Cadillac. So that's really the only reason he ever remembered the three of them was because of the stolen car. So again, that was just in the few days following Kathy's disappearance. 
Now, after they got the tires fixed, Lester, Reed, and Kathy made their way to the Canadian border and arrived at the Tobik First Nation Reservation in New Brunswick, Canada, which was where Reed lived with his family. Now, when Detective Caddy spoke to members of the reservation, they said that they did remember seeing Lester and Kathy. They said that Kathy spent a lot of time crying and said that she wanted to go back to Portland and that she spent most of her time hiding out in the Cadillac because that was their only form of shelter. Now, the members also told Detective Reed that after spending some time on the reservation, Lester dropped Kathy off to stay with Reed and he returned back to the United States. Lester told other members of the reservation that he was going to leave Kathy with Reed because he figured that she would like to be in a house rather than living out of the car. So that was kind of his justification behind it. However, what police theorized is that Lester did not want to bring Kathy back into the United States because he would have been arrested for kidnapping. So two very different perspectives there. But what we do know is that Lester did drop Kathy off with Reed. Now, instead of returning back to Maine, Lester drove all the way down to Florida, where he lived for the next three years before returning to Portland, Maine. Now, when he got back to Portland, he attempted to reach out to Kathy and get in touch with her. However, he was shocked when he learned that Kathy never came back from the reservation. Now, Lester apparently was in such disbelief that Kathy never came home that he enlisted a friend and the two of them drove up to Canada to the reservation to Reed's house to see if Kathy was still there. But when he confronted Reed about Kathy, Reed and his brothers beat Lester severely and stole his jacket and leather boots, telling him never to return to the First Nation Reservation. Now, for all things considered, the police, detectives, family, friends, most people actually believe Lester. They do believe that he truly had no idea what happened to Kathy after he dropped her off with Reed. Now, again, they believe that he dropped her off just to basically cover his tracks and cover his bases because he knew if he went back into the United States that he was most likely going to be caught and charged with kidnapping charges if he was with Kathy. Because in Lester's mind, he knew that there was going to be no way that he was going to be able to drop Kathy off back in Portland and get away with this safe and soundly. It was too far gone. They were past the point of no return, and he decided to basically save his own ass and drop off Kathy with Reed. Now, unfortunately, Detective Caddy was actually never able to speak with Lester because he passed away at the age of 35 in 1985. However, Detective Caddy was able to speak with Reed. When speaking with Reed, Reed insisted that he had no idea what happened to Kathy. However, he refused to elaborate any further. Now, it also should be noted that when Detective Caddy passed out pictures and showed people who lived on the reservation pictures of Kathy, they all claimed that they remembered seeing Kathy on the reservation and that everyone knew her as Reed's girlfriend. Now, here is where things get a little interesting. And as recently as May of 2014, Detective Caddy received a message on Facebook. It said, quote, Hey, Detective Caddy, I read an article about the missing woman, Kathy Moulton, and it was the first I had ever heard of the case, or so I thought. When I saw that Reed was involved, it sparked a memory of a story that my mom's friend had told her while I was eavesdropping. I remember this story because it made me afraid of Reed. Here's the story as I remember it. My mom's friend Brent was drinking with Reed one night when they ran out of alcohol, so they decided to walk to New Brunswick to town to go to the liquor store. On their way back, they stopped at a plot along a walking trail, which Reed claimed was owned by his uncle. Apparently, they sat there and drank for a while while Reed started talking about a girl that he had met over in Maine. He then pointed to an area not far from where they were sitting and told Brent that that's where they buried her. 
I really hope this little bit of information can be of some help, although the only person who can confirm that this happened is deceased, end quote. Then one year later in 2015, Detective Caddy actually spoke with a tribal elder of the reservation who said that in the late fall of 1971, she claimed that she saw Reed dragging a woman into the woods. Apparently, the woman he was dragging was crying and attempting to fight Reed off. However, Reed continued to carry her into the woods. Now, there have been multiple searches of that wooded area. However, nothing was ever discovered. Now, weirdly enough, there was a family who actually lived near that same wooded area, and they claimed that they experienced multiple paranormal activities inside of their home. But more than that, they claimed that one day their dog had actually brought them a human skull that they claim seemed to be bigger than a child's skull, but not as big as an adult. And remember, Kathy went missing when she was 16 years old. However, that skull was never identified. Now, just to intensify things, several years later, Reed was actually arrested for a completely different murder. However, he was never charged. This was for the murder of Judy Campbell. Judy was murdered after leaving a bar in Cambridge, Massachusetts on February 27th of 1978. She was stabbed multiple times and left outside an emergency room. Now, Reed was questioned and arrested for this murder. However, he was never charged. Now, just to make things even weirder, in 1983, there was actually a man who was hunting in the woods of Smyrna, Maine. Smyrna is about a three and a half hour drive away from Portland. And this man claims that while he was hunting in the woods, he came across skeletal remains. He said that the remains themselves were surrounded by female clothing. And weirdly enough, right next to these remains in these clothes, there was a triangular formation of maple syrup bottles. And right next to the maple syrup, there was a very old stove. So you had remains, clothing, syrup, stove. Very strange. And this man says that he was convinced that the remains that he found were from a female because there was actually a bra located on the rib cage of the remains. So basically, this man sees this and he runs out. He runs out of the woods and he contacts police, tells them what he had discovered. And police, as well as this man, all conduct a search and go back into these woods. However, this time, the remains are are not there. They actually searched for a day and a half for these remains and could not find them. Now, whether that's because they just couldn't remember where he saw them or it's because someone got rid of them, we don't know. However, it is a little odd to think that they're searching for a day and a half and they were not able to find them. It does more so lean towards could someone have potentially removed them? And I know it's going to be frustrating when I say this, and I don't even want to say this, but sadly, this is really all the information that we have on the Kathy Moulton case. And even though we do have some answers in this case, we have way more questions questions than we do answers. The questions in this case include, why did Kathy get into the car with Lester to begin with? Why did Kathy not ask for help when she was seen in public places if she was in distress and being held against her will? Why did Lester believe it was okay to leave Kathy with Reed? Why did no one do anything once they saw Reed carrying a woman into the woods or being told that he had buried a woman over in a field? Why did no one do anything? Why did no one say anything? Why was everyone so afraid of Reed? Now, I think that there are multiple theories in this case, and I want to run through them with you. And the first one is that Kathy ran away on her own accord. She willingly went with Lester and Reed to the reservation and stayed there on her own accord, wanted to live with Reed on her own accord. It just doesn't sound too practical. It doesn't sound too 
reasonable to believe that that is what actually happened. The second theory is that Kathy did get into the car willingly. She did drive around with Lester and Reed, but was always under the impression that she was going to be taken back home. However, was kidnapped and brought to the reservation to live with Reed instead. Now, something that I also think should be noted is the relationship between Lester and Reed. It was actually said that Reed was a hitchhiker, and that is how him and Lester met. It was said that while Lester was driving, he saw Reed on the side of the road, and Reed asked if he could drive him up to New Brunswick, Canada to drop him off at home, and Lester agreed. So it definitely makes you wonder where in this entire week-long span of the three of them being together... First of all, where did this agreement start between Reed and Lester? When did they agree that they were also going to take Kathy with them? When was that a part of the conversation? Was it in the very beginning? Was Reed the dominant one in this trio? Was he the one who conducted this whole thing? Or was it a him and Lester combined situation? Which also is very strange because it's not like these two are lifelong pals or buddies or partners or whatever. This is someone that Lester had met just hours before for going on this drive. So it definitely makes you wonder what was Lester and Reed's motivation getting Kathy into the car? Did Lester actually think that he was going to be dropping Kathy off or was he always under the assumption that the three of them were going to go up to New Brunswick together? And is it really fair to believe that Lester just had no idea what he was doing when he left Kathy with Reed? Again, this is his quote unquote girlfriend and he's deciding that he's going to leave Kathy with Reed in Canada because he claimed that she was complaining too much about living in the car and he figured that she would rather live in a house. To me, that just doesn't hold up. It just doesn't really hold up. I think, again, he was trying to cover his own tracks. I think he was being selfish. But my question is, is that do you think that Reed and Lester basically orchestrated this together from the very beginning? Or do you think it was more so a figuring it out as they went along type of deal? Because at a certain point, Lester and Reed realized that they couldn't just drop Kathy back off at home, which to me makes me believe that this was always the plan in some twisted way. Maybe plans changed once Kathy got into the car and Reed saw Kathy and he saw an opportunity to abduct her and he took it. It's just I'm, the the reasoning and the motive behind this is very confusing and strange. And I believe truthfully that that's part of the reason that this case is unsolved is because there's so many missing pieces and parts to it. But I am very interested to hear what you guys have to say about it. Again, unsolved cases are very... They're so frustrating, truthfully. We've covered a lot of solved cases recently in the past few months because I know a lot of you like having this sense of closure when it comes to cases and like knowing the end result. But truthfully, there are so many unsolved cases that still need recognition despite the lack in information. That's the reason it's unsolved because there's no information out there. So I thought that this would be a great case to cover today because it is the anniversary of Kathy's disappearance coming up. And I am, again, mind boggled by this case. And I'm very interested to hear what you have to say about it. But with that being said, you guys, that is all for me today. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Killer Instinct. Again, if you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I'm your host of Killer Instinct. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. Again, we post weekly on the podcast every Wednesday and you're not going to want to miss it. I'll be back next week with a brand new one for you guys. And until then, stay safe. Bye guys. Bye.